FOMO. Everybody in their life at some point runs, ag- runs up against the limit of what humanity has learned. I mean, it doesn't happen all that often, you know, a couple times a year, depending on how you live. But you'll find that you're the first person on the planet that's confronting some specific problem. Or maybe you're not the first person who's confronting it, but you've, you've confronted a problem that has not yet been solved. And if most of us always quit at that point and say, well, I'm not going to do anything where there's no checklist or formula or YouTube video, then the world is a poorer place. That's Jim McKelvey, co-founder of Square and author of The Innovation Stack, Building an Unbeatable Business One Crazy Idea at a Time. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Hey, everybody. Welcome to FOMO sapiens. I am very excited FOMO. today for my guest, Jim McKelvey. Jim is a titan of the startup world. What I like about him is, yeah, I mean, titans are good. We want titans. But more than that... He is also just a really interesting guy, and he's not your stereotypical master of the universe type of person. Uh, Very smart, accomplished person, but also really cool and chill. So for example, got the idea for co-founding Square while he was working as a glassblower. Like, who does that, right? And then, you know, he lives in St. Louis. He's not in the Valley. He's not in Austin or Miami or New York or wherever startup people live, he's in St. Louis. And, you know, fun fact about Jim also, he was Jack Dorsey's second ever boss. We'll get into that a bit later. So he's a really cool guy. And what I love uh, is that we're going to talk about something that I think is super important. And also, I think of great interest to all of you, which is how to build a business that cannot be beat. We're also going to talk about what it really means to be an entrepreneur versus a business person. So we're going to get into all that today. And Jim McKelvey is a great person to do that. Now, he is a serial entrepreneur, an inventor, philanthropist, artist, and author of the new book, The Innovation Stack, Building an Unbeatable Business One Crazy Idea at a Time. He's the co-founder of Square and served as chairman of the board until 2010, and he still serves on the board of directors. In 2011, his iconic card reader design was inducted into the Museum of Modern Art. You all know the old square card reader. I think I've had several iterations of that over the years, and now it's in a museum. So that's, I mean, who does that, right? Jim does. And he is also, this is great too, he's the deputy chair of the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. So this man is a polymath. He's a total homo sapiens, by the way. And I know you're going to love his take Just crawl around inside his brain. There's a lot going on in there that we're all going to learn from today. Now, I have one quick ask for you today, which is please go to patrickmagnus.com where you will find so many great articles about entrepreneurship, 10% entrepreneurship, 100% entrepreneurship. Check out the blog. Check it out because there's so much good stuff. People are, you know, email me all the time or send me LinkedIn's asking me about, for example, where to find uh, an advisory agreement. Well, you can find that on my blog. So go check it out. Let me know if there's something that's missing or that you would like to see there, and we can potentially include it in the future. And now on to the interview. So as I mentioned before, Jim was Jack Dorsey's second ever boss. We all know Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, co-founder of Square. And so to get our conversation started, I asked Jim to tell me a little bit more about the sentence he wrote in the book. He said, Jack Dorsey often says that I was his second boss, and 16 years later, he would become my first. So Jack began working for me uh, after he worked for his mother. So Jack's mother, Marsha Dorsey, was his first boss, and I was his second. And uh, we picked him up uh, straight out of Shenandoah Coffee Company here in St. Louis when he was 15 years old. He rode his bike over to my office. We we got him to pull an all-nighter with us the first night, and he got in a lot of trouble with Marsha. But Jack uh, and I have been working together on and off uh, ever since. That's amazing. And it's a fun story because you you just realize that how many times the people that we meet in our lives in unexpected ways can turn into our business partners or our quote unquote bosses or our co-founders. So be nice to everybody. <laughs> Look around and see who's around you that's smart and engage them. Now, Jim, you talk early in the book about the word entrepreneur and you sort of talk about the fact that the word entrepreneur has been watered down 
And so I want to just start, because we're going to be talking a lot about entrepreneurship today, about the word entrepreneur and how you view it and use it. So in order to write this book, I had to dust off the original definition. Uh Uh-huh. And the original definition, which uh, the economist Joseph Schumpeter basically coined, uh, was this maverick weirdo who was doing something different than normal business. And so the word entrepreneur was created because he he needed a way to differentiate the people who were copying and doing you know businesses that had formula um, from somebody who didn't have a formula and was trying to invent. And the processes are so different that Schumpeter basically coined this term. And in order to write the innovation stack, I started to try to, try to describe the experience that we'd lived through at Square and that I had studied in all these other companies. And all of a sudden, yeah, I start to write and I realize I don't have a word in English because the word entrepreneur today means business person. Like you can be an entrepreneur who, you know, starts an accounting firm. You can be an entrepreneur who starts a, you know, a street cleaning service or a pharmacy or, you know, it is, it is a perfectly legitimate use of the term to uh, describe anybody who's a business person. But that's not how I use it. I use it strictly in its antique crazy meaning, which is you're doing something, or I should say, you're trying to do something that's never been done. And so I guess for the people listening to this show, I mean, you're right. The word entrepreneur has become, it's, it's become very massified, right? In fact, if you look at on LinkedIn, Everybody describes themselves as an entrepreneur because being an entrepreneur is cool, right? Yeah, it's like the word university. It turns out the word university can be applied to anything. It doesn't mean anything. Like you can have, you know, Patrick's University. And and it's, I mean, they don't, there's no standard for using that word. It sounds impressive, but it doesn't mean anything. And so your definition is really about the mavericks out there. And so it's the people who are, and this is what the book is about, they're finding a problem that has not yet been solved. And then despite the fact that, I mean, you know, there's no sort of clear path yet, they are undertaking a journey to try to solve that problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the whole reason for writing the book was to encourage fewer people to quit. It was basically to stop the attrition. Because what happens is... Everybody in their life at some point runs ag- runs up against the limit of what humanity has learned. I mean, it doesn't happen all that often, you know, a couple times a year, depending on how you live. But you'll find that you're the first person on the planet that's confronting some specific problem. Or maybe you're not the first person who's confronting it, but you've, you've confronted a problem that has not yet been solved. And if most of us always quit at that point and say, well, I'm not going to do anything where there's no checklist or formula or YouTube video, then the world is a poorer place. So I wanted to encourage people in a very sort of humble manner to say, look, you don't have to be some specialist or genius or savant to be successful, but you will probably be very uncomfortable doing it. And here's why and here's what it looks like. So let's dive right in. This book is called The Innovation Stack. And, you know, you define it. I'm going to get you to do it in a second. But the way I sort of read it is it's about having an interlocking series of inventions that you use to build and scale a business. But just to dive into it, how how do you define the the innovation stack and, and how does that fit into the idea of entrepreneurship? So the innovation stack was this thing that I found was a commonality between all these companies. So what I did was I started looking for companies that had been through existential threats where they should have died. Mm. So this was a case where, you know, everybody dies except you. And then what makes you special? And it turns out that there are a lot of those examples if you mine history. And going through history, I found that all of these companies had this thing, and I needed a name for the thing. And, And the thing I called an innovation stack because that's what it kind of was. If you look at you know the commonalities between an airline or a furniture store or frozen foods or electric vehicles or you know any of these companies that I did as study, you'll find this thing. And it's this messy, interlocking group of unique behaviors, inventions, if you will. And so that's an innovation stack. It's not this intimidating, weird thing. It's not something that you know you can have a checklist and build, but it is something that results from this process and it unites all these companies. Yeah, so it's not a framework. I, I think you said early on, listen, if you're looking for a perfect plan to build a business and, and you think you're going to read this book and have it at the end, that's not what's happening here. This is more about y- your putting order on chaos around different activities that different companies do. Is, is that fair? 
It is. It is. In fact, this book is sort of the opposite of the checklist. So when you find yourself in a situation for which there is no checklist, that's when the lessons of the innovation stack will be valuable. Now, look, they might not be if you don't choose to do anything. It's It sort of assumes that you will uh, want to change something that's never been changed before. But if that's the case, then your whole life has been really preparation in application of other people's knowledge. I mean, that's what school is. That's what business is. That's, that's what most of the stuff that we do. I mean, and me included, like 90, 99 point repeating decimal. Uh, uh, I will always look to copy somebody who has figured it out before me. But occasionally I'm thrown into these situations where nobody's figured it out. And then I have to ask myself, okay, am I willing to do this fairly uncomfortable process called innovation, called invention, where I don't get to copy. And that's when the, le- the lessons of the innovation stack apply. Gotcha. So it's like you you get to that point where something isn't working, you pull out the old user's manual, you flip to the end of it, and there's blank pages. And it's your <laughs> job to fill in the blank pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you choose to continue? I love right. it. All right, all right. There's, so. a, there's a disclaimer. The like the last page is a we're not responsible for what happens to you. You sign away and go. <laughs> That's a bit, well, I like that a lot. I like the uh, thinking about it that way. Now, um, let's start. You have you know. Let's take the example of Square. We're going to talk about Square here. Um, you you know you'd been an entrepreneur before. It's not like you'd never done that, but you had sort of stepped away and were working as a glass blower. And one day you're in your studio and you find what you deem to be a perfect problem. And it's this problem that nobody has solved before that it is in your power to go after and solve. So I'd love to hear the story of how you found that perfect problem and and how you came up with the idea of starting Square. So it was funny. Uh, starting the company was actually Jack Dorsey's idea. So Jack started Twitter, and after Twitter kicked him out, uh, he came back and he said, hey, Jim, you want to start a company with me? And I was like, yeah, sure, Jack. What do you want to do? He's like, I don't know. What do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. So we were casting around for ideas. We'd had a couple of, I, I would say, okay ideas. They weren't great, but we had already hired our first programmer. So he was starting. And we had to sort of get our act together. And I was back in St. Louis packing up my studio because I – was working as a glass blower. um, And I was trying to sell this piece to this lady who only had an American Express card. I couldn't accept it. I lost the sale. And I was really upset because this piece had been sitting on the shelf for years. And I looked down at my iPhone and I thought, why in the world does this iPhone, like this magic device that automatically becomes a book or a TV or a stock ticker, like the iPhone magically transforms into whatever I need it to be. Um, And it didn't transform into a payment register. And I was like, this is what we should do. I should make my iPhone magically transform into a credit card machine. So I called Jack on my iPhone. And I was like, hey, man, I think I know what we should do with our company. And he loved the idea. So that's how we uh, began our journey into the payments world. And I should tell you this. Neither Jack nor I knew anything about payments. We didn't know how hard the journey was going to be. You know, I figured this was going to be you know, a couple weeks of work. Um, I figured it'd be this, you know, sort of moderately cool thing that m- maybe some of my friends would use. We had no idea that we were, uh, first of all, committing to so much effort, and secondly, that it would have such a large impact. Did you realize at the time? Were you looking at other things as well? Did you have a list of like thirty things, and then this one just came, and you had an aha moment? It was like, let's go after this one, or was it was it different than that? It wasn't so much aha, and since you've asked me not to swear on your pers- on your show, I will not tell you the word that I used <laughs> when I lost this sale. But it was it was this burning anger, really, okay. because I've I've been there. Like I know what it's like to lose a sale. I know what it's like to essentially be ripped off as a small merchant. Because as a small merchant, I did accept Mastercard and Visa at my studio, and I knew that they were you know, just exploiting us. But I also knew that I was too small to do anything about it just by myself. So getting into that world was, you know, was sort of revenge. Uh, it was sort of noble, but it was also sort of dark. And I won't tell you what, you know, combination there were, because I don't, honestly, it was 12 years ago. I don't really remember. Um, but it was not all just, oh, let's do good for the world. It was more like, man, I am so sick of getting ripped off. I am so sick of this. I am just so frustrated uh, that that was a lot of the energy, at least for me. You know, the dark energy, it's funny you say that. It makes me think the first time I really started writing seriously and started working on a book, 
was because I was mad about something. And so I sat down and I decided to basically like, uh, basically address all my problems on paper in a way that I could come out the winner in a fictional setting. Now, it wasn't a good book, but the anger fueled me. Now, you talk about the perfect problem and you write that the magic ingredient for solving a perfect problem is you, but you just told me that neither of you two had payments experience. So I wonder, as you think about the, the sort of founder product fit, which is you know, a term that you hear a lot about is people, you know, pitch out their ideas. It's like, well, why you? How did you think about, number one, your relationship to payments? And then how would you maybe address the fact that you didn't have that experience? So let's, you used a phrase, perfect problem, which I specifically defined in the book. Uh -huh. And so for your listeners, um, what I mean is a, a perfect problem is take the universe of all problems and divide them into ones that have been solved. Okay. Now let's ignore those and only focus on problems that have not been solved. And in the world of problems that have not been solved, there are two subgroups. The solvable ones, these are the ones that if we try, we can solve. And then the unsolvable ones, these are the ones that even if we try, it's not gonna get it's not gonna happen. So I focus on that first set, the, the subset called perfect problems. These are solvable. They can be they can be done, but they never have been done. So now let's think about expertise. Okay, well, if something has never been done, how can anyone be an expert? And this is the commonality that I saw, not just in myself, but in all these other companies that I studied, which was their founders had these sort of irrelevant resumes. They, they had no experience in the market. And you'd say, oh, well, maybe that's an advantage. But it's, it's just zero. Like you don't have any expertise in something that has never been done before, which means, you know, the corollary is, look, the first time anything happens – it's done by somebody who's not an expert. And that's, I think, very empowering because most of us are not experts. Most of us find ourselves in these situations, and we're just as ignorant as everybody else. Um, but the problem, Patrick, is that I think at least my training, because I was trained as an engineer, um, has been to stop if I'm not an expert and go acquire that expertise. And that's a good way to do it. Like if I want to fly a plane today, I would be an idiot to not take training. But the Wright brothers couldn't get flight training because no human had ever flown before. So you know, if you sit there and say, well, wait, if, if everybody has to have training, mankind would still be you know, terrestrial bound. So what I'm saying is, yeah, look, your, your, your instincts, your feelings, and probably your friends and family are going to say, stop, because you're not qualified to do this. And my answer to that is, okay, some things people will never be qualified to do. And it's always clear the first time. Gotcha. So don't let it hold you back. If you're trying to solve a problem that has never been solved before, nobody else has either. Yeah. So I got you. Now, when you were raising money, this is something I like this. You put a slide in your deck and I've never seen, nobody's that I know anyway, and I've seen a lot of decks has copied you so far. Um, maybe they will now, but you had a slide that was titled 140 reasons why Square will fail. So tell, tell us why you did that and the effect that it had on the investors. So, uh, I mean, I like discussing points of failure and Jack likes the number 140. Um, <laughs> look, it, was, it, it, was a great, it was a great slide because what it does is it changes the entire tenor of the pitch. So if, you, if you've been th ever been through a VC pitch, there's these sort of horrible things where one side is lying and the other side is sort of interrogating. And the entrepreneurs are expected to show these, you know, sort of rosy projections and everything's going to be great. And we're perfectly set to do this and nothing can go wrong. And that's, of course, a lie. But it's never exposed as a lie, <laughs> at least directly. So we thought it would be very um, uh, sort of easy to just openly talk about all the things that could kill Square. And there were over 100 of them. We had 140. Now, there were you know, a couple crazy ones, like a robot uprising and stuff. But you know, <laughs> generally, um, we had uh, an attack by Amazon as one of the things that could be um, deadly to us. Uh, you know, Apple could have kept us out of the App Store. Um, you know, the Visa MasterCard could have kept us off their networks. Like, there are all these sort of existential threats. And to, to bring that energy into the room really changed the entire pitch. Instead of the VCs seeing themselves as these people who had to attack our lies. They saw that as these two, you know, kids who didn't know what the heck they were doing and 
probably needed help. And so it was funny because actually one of the board members uh, from Amazon said, oh, well, you know, we can keep Amazon away from you if you take our money. And actually, they eventually invested and Amazon attacked us anyway. <laughs> so, you know, but, but, but it really helped the pitch. You just set me up for my next question, which is we're going to 2014 now. You've been in business for five years. And despite the, the I don't know, <laughs> protestations and or um, uh, warranties, I would say, of, of this investor that they're going to keep Amazon from gunning for you. They, I mean, you know, Amazon, when they want to do something, they don't, they don't hold back. So they copy your hardware. They undercut your price by 30%. They start offering live customer support, which was very compelling. Um, so they are coming for you. I can only imagine what that felt like. And yet you survive. So tell us about what happened and how when you flip the manual to that last blank page, you found a path forward to survive. So it was totally chilling. I mean, we had the board meeting right after that announcement was made. And very, very experienced people on our board nobody had an idea of what we could do to combat Amazon. And so what we did was what any company would do. We went looking for other companies that had survived Amazon, planning to copy what they had done and couldn't find any survivors. So we had nobody to copy from. So then we had this sort of introspective moment where we said, okay, well, what should we do differently? And the funny answer that we came up with was all the stuff we're doing, including the price that we were charging, which was 30% higher than what Amazon was charging, uh, we were doing for very good reasons that we didn't think made any sense to change. And so we didn't do anything differently. Now, that's not to say that it wasn't terrifying. It was just to say that, well, wait a second, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And I guess hope for the best. I mean, maybe that was a strategy, hope for the best. Uh, but it was really a, contra a, a conscious examination of what Square had chosen to do. And it was, in fact, our innovation stack. Now, we didn't call it that. The 14 things that we were doing differently from the market had not been you know, sort of labeled an innovation stack yet. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have that on insight for another five years, really. But, uh, but it was this funny thing to look at Amazon, which was the alpha predator in the tech ecosystem and say, okay, you're coming after us and we're not going to change a thing. We're not even going to flinch. And it, amazingly, a Amazon relented. Like after a year, they gave up and they actually mailed square readers to their soon-to-be former customers. And, and, and that's actually what led to the book because I was so blown away by the results of what had happened that I, I asked myself, well, well, why did this happen? Like, okay, so I'm glad we won, but why did we win? And then I started, you know, researching other companies, you know, that it had similar experiences. And, you know, it turns out history is full of them if you go back in time long enough. And they all have this innovation stack. And I was like, oh, my God, there's a pattern here, um, which, which is what led me to Southwest Airlines. So Herb Kelleher, uh, uh, the legendary founder of Southwest Airlines, I looked at Southwest as, as sort of a square. Now, you'd say airlines and payments have nothing in common with each other, and they're flying planes, and we're you know swiping visa cards. And I mean, but to me, they were both the same because they had both survived these really low odds situations in their founding. So I flew down to Dallas, and I showed all my research. It was just research at the time to Herb. And he got really excited, and he said, he said, yeah, you know, I, I didn't look at it this way, but what you say was what happened at at Southwest. And, and then <laughs> there's a problem with talking to one of your business idols. Herb actually gave me a homework assignment. Herb, Herb said, he said, well, how are you going to share this with the rest of the world? And I was like, oh my God, I got to write a book. So, um, so that's, that's, that was sort of the genesis of it was this attack by Amazon caused this basically research project so that I could, you know, figure out what had happened to me. Um, and then it led to Herb's doorstep and now to the book. When you think about these decisions, because you know, the are decisions, the decision to do nothing is still a decision. Like, you know, if you yeah. had told me we were so scared that we just froze and then we won, I would, I would believe you as well. But I, you know, I, I, I believe that you credibly chose that, but well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was not paralysis entirely, mm -hmm. but the question is, okay, you're going to, you want to do something. You absolutely want to do something when you're attacked, but what do you do? And our answer was, we do exactly what we're doing because everything we were doing was 
being done for customers or for reasons that we thought were necessary for the market. So we couldn't think of anything else. It reminds me a lot when you talk to entrepreneurs and they're very afraid of their competitors. Understandably, especially when it's Amazon, right? But to the point where they get the FOMO and they feel like everything their competitor does, they have to match or better. When in fact, it takes them off of their own game. And if you're doing the right things, then you're just distracting yourself. So having that conviction is important, right? It, it, it is in certain cases. In other cases, it is absolutely appropriate to copy what your competitors are doing. So if you're in a market where there is little differentiation between companies and one company makes a move, you must always copy that move. It's, it's sort of the rule of business. Mm -hmm. and, and that really exists for a very good reason, which is to say you don't want everybody else to have an advantage that you don't. And so this is why all banks kind of look like every other bank and, you know, pick a coffee shop and they kind of look like the other coffee shops. Pick almost any business and you'll see that they're structured very, very similarly. And if one company invents something, it's not long before everybody else figures out how to do the same thing. That applies throughout business with one exception. And that exception is the entrepreneurial companies, the companies that are actually you know, sort of running these innovation stacks of their own, which differentiate them so much that in that case, you shouldn't copy. And if a competitor tries to replicate what you're doing, they're going to fail for a bunch of other reasons that I explain in the book, and you can kind of ignore them. And I know that's insane to say you can ignore competition. But in fact, if you're running the playbook in the innovation stack, you don't have to worry about it. When you think about the entrepreneurs that you write about, the kind of entrepreneurs that are running these businesses, whether it's Herb Kelleher at Southwest, whether it's the folks at Ikea, yourself, what, what are the traits? I mean, is it possible to look at those people and say, you know what, there's this common thread, whether it's you know something that they're born, whether it's something that they've lived with, whether it's some sort of character um, attribute, do you see anything across that or are they all sort of very different? So there's this combination of sort of humility and hubris, right? Pride to think that you can do something. Um, but then the ability to also accept the fact that you don't know what you're doing because you're not an expert. You're a lawyer starting an airline, like Herb was. Uh, you're a glass blower or a, I don't know what Jack, Jack's a massage therapist. That's his professional credential, actually. Uh, you know, massage therapist and a glass blower starting a payments company. Um, you're somebody who has to be humble because you have to take in you have to take input from your surroundings but you also have to have the ability to keep going the ability to say well this is really unpleasant but i'm not going to quit um and then i guess if you want to be alliterative here um a third h that i always thought was huge was humor like like the ability to laugh and i didn't meet so so just full disclosure here most of the entrepreneurs that i study are long dead um, because I didn't want to use contemporary examples too much because most of them are, are these tech companies that have these insane, uh, you know, uh, e e you know, viral growth and, and marketplace lock. And there are a bunch of things that'll make you successful as a high growth tech company that have nothing to do with originality or unique behavior. Um, and so I wanted to exclude those. So unfortunately I was confined to history for most of my studies, but if I look at the people who, and, and read their diaries and, and, and study them. Like these were great, fun people. And I have to imagine that when, you know, things went wrong, uh, many of them were laughing. Humility, hubris, and humor. What I will start calling Hugh Cubed. There you go. You can use that if you want. That'll be your, you know, I, no, no, my gift to you. Uh, the next I have trouble pronouncing the letter H. So That's it's the next all FOMO, yours. everybody. Just get ready. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The book is called The Innovation Stack, Building an Unbeatable Business, One Crazy Idea at a Time. The website is jimmckelvey.com. Jim McKelvey, thanks so much for being here. Patrick, thanks you so much. This has been super fun. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. 
theme music is by Mike McGinnis and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO. FOMO.